Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And John, thanks for inviting me. You're going to get that book out of me one way or another, aren't you? <laughs> well, what I want to talk to you guys about today is hope. Because that's the greatest thing that God has taught me about throughout the course of these last 25 years that I've been a Christian. Is his hope. It's just, uh, he's constantly restoring and renewing us. And 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So to really tell you this story, I've got to go back a little bit. Um, we moved out to Arizona from Ohio in 1977. I was nine years old. I moved out with my mom and dad and my brother and sister. I'm the middle child. My brother was 12 when we moved out. I was nine, and my sister was eight months old. <clears throat> Arizona was a really tough adjustment for my brother and I. It was just very difficult to come from beautiful Ohio with trees to climb and soft grass and uh, to come here to, you know, the best thing that they had for grass was a weed called Bermuda grass. <laughs> I didn't understand it. I just thought this was the most godforsaken place. No trees to climb. I hated it. The only tree we had was a Palo Verde tree, and it had big black bugs living in it. Oh, it's just so sad. But whatever the case, we didn't uh, make that choice as a democracy. My parents just moved us. So here we were in Arizona, and he we were, at the time we were living in Paradise Valley, we didn't know what that meant. And very soon we came to know what it meant. And, and, and I really hated it because we did not fit that Paradise Valley lifestyle. So we went, we started school. We were in the Scottsdale school system going to Kiva Elementary School. And when my brother was in eighth grade, he got caught smoking pot. Well, my parents' response to that was to take us both out of public school and to move us promptly to this Southern Baptist Christian school. Now, keep in mind, this was not for our spiritual edification that this move was made. This was made in an effort to keep my brother out of trouble. And I got to share in the joy of that. <laughs> <laughs> now, by way of what my religious background had been, we were baptized Greek Orthodox. <clears throat> and that's a lot like Catholic, except it's Greek. <laughs> and so my church experience was pretty minimal. Most of the service was in another language, one that I didn't understand, so I didn't have a clue. But that was the experience. Well, this school talked about uh, salvation and heaven and hell and a relationship with Jesus and there was a very very heavy emphasis on hellfire and brimstone and so I was scared to death and they talked about getting saved and though I'm sure that their desire was to win souls for Christ the effect it had on me was a terrorizing effect so every day we had chapel Every day of school, we had chapel for about an hour, and every day it ended with that question, do you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that if you died today, you would go to heaven? And I just never knew. I was terrified. So that first year in Christian school, I probably prayed that prayer about 50 times. God say 50 times. I'm definitely going. <laughs> While it's true that my relationship with Jesus began out of fear of hell, over the years, it has transformed into an amazing love relationship, the most important relationship of my life, and how God held on to me through the toughest, darkest times of my life and never let go and has allowed me to be here today to tell the story is mind-boggling. Just can't, I, I still can't believe it. But that is God. And for us to be able to explain his infinite grace and mercy is uh, beyond our little small pea brains, at least mine. 
Well, it's clear that the Bible tells us that there are none that seek God, but that he draws us to him. We see that both in Romans 3.11 and John 6.44. Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Well, God knew that very soon that 11-year-old girl would desperately need something of substance to cling to through the dark years that were about to come. So he came and got me, and he drew me to him, and he held me fast. In his incredible grip of grace, as I started this very long, dark journey of my life. In 1982, I was, uh, and now at this point, I am no longer at the Southern Baptist School. My parents realized this wasn't really a good fit, so they moved us to this charismatic church just down (laughs) the road. So we had the whole spectrum. Hellfire and Brimstone, dancing in the aisles. I'm a well-rounded Christian. (laughs) However, in 1982, at this point I'm 13, about to turn 14, they find that I have this tumor. And this tumor is about the size of a softball and it's on my left adrenal gland. And they don't really know what exactly it is they're dealing with at Good Sam, but they have an idea. So they go in, they remove that first tumor surgically. It's a very risky operation. There's a 50-50 chance that I wouldn't even make it through the surgery. But you know, God doesn't really follow those statistics or percentages, and I came out just fine. They biopsied this tumor, and they believed, based on its cellular structure, that it was, in fact, benign. However, they did know, based on its cellular structure, that it was likely to recur. So every six months, they would test me to see if this thing was back. Well, three years later, in April of 85, the tumor was back. The test came back positive. And this time, there wasn't one. There were between 12 and 14, and they were primarily in my liver. So they knew that that first tumor was, in fact, malignant, because that's the way cancer will behave. It will go to a major organ. So this is in April of 85. Well, a few months prior, in January of 85, My parents, who had been married 21 years, called it quits, got a divorce. And it was a very bitter, horrible, nasty divorce. And then four months later, in April, they find out that their daughter has cancer. And the doctors tell them that she's not going to live. She's not going to live to graduate from high school. You have a terminally ill child. So my parents, who are in the midst of this bitter divorce, are thrown back together through this uh, calamity in my life. Well, even in that, in all the struggle and strain and suffering and me being a 16-year-old going, this sucks. I have cancer. I'm 16. This is the pits. God was at work, and he had set divine appointments. I can look back on my life and see the divine appointments that God had set in place for for me, and the glory of that is he's doing it for each one of us, whether we recognize it and see it as a different story. But now looking back, I see how God was ever faithful. And there just happened to be this endocrinologist who was coming back from the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And he knew that there was a research program going on for this particular kind of cancer. Now, this tumor is called a pheochromocytoma. There will be a test at the end, and I <laughs> want you all to spell that for me. So we, we uh, had this appointment with NIH. The government flew me back to the National Institutes of Health, and for nine weeks I was in the hospital being diagnosed. They needed to make sure that I was a perfect fit for this protocol. Well. As it turns out, I was the seventh person in the country with this type of cancer. And I happened to be the youngest of the seven. At the time, I was 16, and the next uh, 
the next person up for me was 36. So what they did is they put me on chemotherapy. It was an experiment. They did not know what was going to happen. They were taking the seven, us, seven of us to see what they could do. And they told me that I was on chemotherapy indefinitely, perhaps for the rest of my life. And chemotherapy is not something that our bodies are designed to sustain for the rest of your life. And they told me that I would not live to graduate from high school. They told me that the chemotherapy would make me infertile. I would not be able to have kids because as, uh, along with all the bad things that the chemotherapy kills, it also kills good things like your eggs. And they said this was going to kill all of my eggs. I would never be able to have children. Well, I stayed on the chemotherapy for approximately three years. And uh, as throughout my three years on the chemotherapy, the other people on the program are dropping like flies. As it stands today, I'm the only one left alive of the original seven. I'm the only remaining uh, survivor. And um, at the time, you can imagine, this was such a devastating time. I'm, a, I'm now 17. I have my first chemotherapy treatment on my 17th birthday. Uh, I'm a junior in high school with terminal cancer, very angry that this is my circumstance, but not with God, with the circumstance. I mean, how could it be that someone 17 can have cancer? It's one of those things that just shouldn't be. Like a parent should never have to watch a child die. It just shouldn't be. But I was very stubborn, and I was adamant that I was not going to die. I had a very big attitude problem. But it worked out in my favor. God knew. He, he wired me that way. I had too much to live for, too much to do, too much to experience. God was holding on to me, much like the footprints in the sand palm that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And his faithfulness to me at that time is so apparent now. How he never left. Not for a second was I alone in this. So after... Um, Almost three years on chemotherapy, I go in for my treatment, not knowing that this would be my last treatment, but this was a particularly horrific treatment. At this point, my veins were pretty much shot. It was very hard to get an IV in to run the chemotherapy drugs. And this, was, this happened to be on Halloween. My, uh, what would be my last treatment was on Halloween. And as I'm walking into the doctor's office, I can still see what it looked like. There was a storm coming and I was watching the dust swirl around my feet and I knew it was going to be a big storm that night. And as I uh, went in for my treatment, they started, it, it normally took about two and a half hours to run the drugs in. And that day my IV infiltrated five times, which meant that they had to take it out and start it over again because it wasn't working properly. My veins were just shot. Well, the last time that it infiltrates, the lights go out. So we have no electricity, and I have a nurse standing there with a flashlight under her arm, a needle in her, and I just thought, oh, this is too much. <laughs> and at this point, God spoke to my heart that this was the end, that this was my last chemotherapy treatment. And I had this tremendous peace that I knew it would be okay. Now, I say that with this one qualification. I, I knew that it would be okay. I did not know if that meant that I would die and be okay or that I would live and be okay, but I knew that I would be okay. So I went off chemotherapy and I never went back to the doctor. I didn't discuss this with anybody. I just went off. I decided I had all the fun I was willing to have and I had done everything medically I was willing to do and that was that. My mother happened to work for John C. Lincoln Hospital in the laboratory. So we would do this test on our own, me and her. Every six months, we would do the test that we needed to do to see what was happening. And it wasn't until I went off chemotherapy that my numbers ever became normal. So now my, well, now I'm normal, which that's debatable, but it's another story. So I'm, my test results are showing that I am normal. And we continu continue to do the test every year or so. I go on to college to do all the things that I wanted to do, that the doctor said I would never be able to do. Th and there I met my future husband, Randy. I graduated from college in December of 1991, and now I 
Now I am uh, five years past my expiration date, according to the doctors. <laughs> and I got married in May of 1993. Went to law school in August of 94, graduated in May of 97. And somewhere in that time frame, I stopped testing. We stopped doing the test because I decided, why am I testing? If it ever comes back, I'm not going on chemotherapy again. I'm just, I'm done with it. So I stopped testing. I come back to Arizona, I take the bar exam, I get my results in October, and uh, I get a job with the city of Phoenix. I start with the city on June 1st of 1998. My benefits went into effect that next month, July 1st of 98, and then much to my surprise, on July 3rd, two days after my benefits go into effect, I find out I'm pregnant. Well, that should not happen. I mean, I... <laughs> should not have happened. I was stunned, shocked, could not believe it, and uh, <laughs> believe me when I say the first words out of my mouth were not, oh, joy. <laughs> I was stunned. And so I gave birth to a healthy baby boy, February 22nd, 1999. Another thing the doctor said would never happen, never be able to have a baby. Here I had this, this child, and my son Christopher is just the joy of my heart. He is Boy, he's teaching me so much about grace and mercy and yeah. patience. <laughs> My dad keeps saying something about, uh, you know, you, you get what you deserve. He's just like you. And I, I still dispute that. But <laughs> anyway, Christopher is two years old. Today, Christopher, he's going to be six in February. But when he's about two years old, I start having this nagging feeling that I need to start testing again. Because, of course, you mothers out there know there's nothing you wouldn't do for your child. You would walk through fire. You would certainly go through chemotherapy again if that's what it took. So I do the test. In April of 2001, I do the test, and it comes back positive. This thing is back, and I am horrified. We find out April 2001 that it's elevated. The numbers are elevated. So we start, that starts the whole process of testing again. MRIs, CAT scans. Let's see what this thing looks like. I have a CAT scan on May 10th of 2001, or an MRI on May 10th of 2001, which May 10th also happens to be my birthday. On May 12th, my mother, who it was at my house every day, picked my son up from preschool every day, was very much a part of our lives. She was at a party and she collapsed to the floor. They admitted her to the, into the hospital. And on May 17th, the very next week, she died. All of a sudden, without explanation. They were doing a heart cath on her. They were gonna do radiofrequency ablation, the same thing that Dick Cheney had done later that summer. <coughs> The surgeon that had done this on my mom said, uh, in over 20 years of having done this procedure over 2,000 times, I've never lost anybody. He was stunned. I was stunned. She was supposed to come out of this procedure a new woman, and she died right there on the table. Well, that same night, I get the results from my oncologist. The tumors are back. There are between two and four of them this time. And you can imagine that day, still as I look back, it's very surreal to think that in that same day, this, this is like a soap opera or something, that you, your mother dies, you find out you have tumors all the same day. It just was a bad day. But I was reminded as, uh, as I was, you know, throughout this process, I'm fully leaning on God, trusting him that, you know, he has a purpose and a plan, that he did not give me this child to end in tragedy. I just couldn't believe that that's what it was. And I was reminded of the verse in Job where he says, Though he slays me, I will trust him. And believe me, on that day, I was being slain. But I trust him. And I learned over the years that hope and God is often a matter of timing. In, in the story of Hagar really rings true to me. You remember the story that God promised Abraham that he would have an heir. He would have a son and that his heirs would outnumber the stars in the sky. Well, God was not working fast enough for Sarah. So she says to him, go sleep with Hagar and uh, let that be your heir. 
And so he does, and Hagar gets pregnant. And then Sarah starts to resent her, and she starts to mistreat her. So Hagar flees. And the Lord sends the angel to her, and he says, go back. I'm going to take care of you through this. And Hagar then uh, says, she, she has a name for God. She calls him the God who sees me. And that is so often how I view my relationship with God. He is the God who sees me. He saw me in my suffering. He saw me in my pain. He knew exactly that my heart was breaking, both with the loss of my mom and the fear that, he, that my son was also going to have to deal with the loss of his mom at only two years old. But I knew that he was the God who saw me, and I knew that he would provide. And I did not know how this story was going to end, because as you all know, Christians are not exempt. Just because we're Christians doesn't mean we don't get cancer, doesn't mean we don't have tragic stories to tell. The difference is, is that we have God, the God who sees us walking every step of the way, holding our hand. Well, the doctors felt that it would be best to watch and see what happened with this tumor. Since I had stopped testing for those years, they weren't sure exactly where we were. Though they saw these tumors in my liver, they also knew that that was the exact spot the tumors were in back in 1985 when they found this thing. So they really believed this was the same process, that perhaps these had been dormant for a number of years, and then they sort of woke up. Nobody's sure what woke them up. But the fact is, we were waiting and, see, and seeing what happened. That was the doctor's plan. Well, in June of 2003, <clears throat> we did the test again, and now the numbers were off the charts. It was clear that this thing was becoming aggressive. We did an MRI, and we saw that the one tumor had doubled in size. Well, as it turns out, there is this new technology that they are uh, using called radiofrequency ablation. And this technology is something that had not been around five years earlier. And what this is is they see where the tumors are using ultrasound technology. Then they take this probe. They guide the probe right into the tumor. They flip a switch, and these tines pop out. So it looks somewhat like an umbrella without the netting. They flip another switch, and they start to fry. They cook the tumors inside your body, and that's what they did. They did this procedure uh, July 31st, 2003, and it was successful. And they killed those two tumors, and we did, ever since then, the tests have been normal, praise God. However, we did a PET scan in uh, January of 2004. And as it would be, there is still another tumor in me. I have one more tumor. But my numbers are normal. And, and the way this thing, when you know this thing is going, you see the numbers go with it. And I'm quite certain that that tumor remains there for God to teach me another lesson. And that I, I must fully rely on him every step of the way. And I have no promise of tomorrow, but guess what? Neither do you. And that's why every day matters. Every day is significant. And future is an uncertainty, but this day, right now, this moment is not. And through this all, I've learned about the promises of God. And each day, I continue to learn more. But there are certainties that we do have to hold on to, these promises of God. And I'll just share with you a few of these that have been so instrumental in my life. In Hebrews 3, 5, we're told that God will never leave or forsake us. Now, the, the Hebrew word used there for never, actually, when it's translated, means never five times. That's how profound that statement is meant to be made. He will never, 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 never leave or forsake you. That is powerful. You can hold on to the promise that whatever you go through, he's with you every step of the way. And we also know he'll never give us more than we can handle. We know that we will never be separated from his love. And we also know, and this is a big one for me, that his love for us is not based on our performance. Because if it was, 
really none of us would measure up. I mean, his love is something that he extends to us freely. And in all of this, we have hope. We have a hope in God, and it's hope not like the world hopes, but hope that really you can grab onto and sink your teeth in and know that he will not fail. Even though we cannot understand the circumstances, we cannot understand uh, what we're going through, we know that God is in control. He's still on the throne, whatever the situation is in our life. And that's the hope that we have. And it's the invisible line that goes from our heart straight to the throne room of God. And he is holding us. <clears throat> and I just want to close with verse Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. So my encouragement to you today is to attach your heart to him, knowing he can lift you out of every situation. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor to be able to come speak to you today.